I'm Alex Michelson. This week, the issue is Omicron arrives in California. So what does that mean for you and me? With us, California's Health and Human Services Secretary, Dr. Mark Galley, will break it down. Could more lockdowns be ahead? Our panel this week, Bob Shrum on the left, Mike Murphy on the right, breaking down the politics of COVID and of California crime. Then an exclusive one-on-one -on -one with the U.S. Secretary of Labor, Marty Walsh, for the middle of a construction zone. The issue is starts right now. Broadcasting across California, California's only statewide political show. You're watching The Issue Is. And welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson. The big story this week, the emergence of a new strain of COVID-19 that has us continuing to go through the Greek alphabet. This one is called Omicron and is now officially here in California. So far, we know a little bit about it, but a whole lot of questions remain. President Biden already has implemented travel restrictions and is considering more. But he says he is not looking at any more widespread lockdowns. In the Central Valley this week, the governor, with a similar message, our guest this week is Governor Newsom's top advisor on public health. Dr. Mark Galley is California's Secretary of Health and Human Services. He's a pediatrician by training, and he's the father of four young kids. Dr. Galley, welcome back to The Issue Is. Nice to be with you, Alex. All right, so as a pediatrician, you are used to explaining complicated medical concepts to young kids in a concise way. So pretend I'm a young child and help me explain what is Omicron and why should I care? So uh, Omicron is a strain of the COVID virus. Uh, it has changed over time. You heard about the alpha variant, then you heard a little bit about beta, We've talked a lot about the Delta variant. Each one of those is a slightly different form of COVID with a different genetic makeup that allows it to do different things when it gets into the human body. Some, some of these different variants uh, are more effective at getting into the human cells. Others uh, trigger a more intense response from our bodies that create maybe more severe illness. So Omicron is yet another variant that has mutated a bit and causes us to maybe not recognize it as well. So we might get more easily infected. Maybe our body responds to it a little bit differently. And maybe the vaccines that have been uh, really strong and supportive uh, behave a little bit differently in Omicron. So what is the best case scenario of how this could work out with Omicron? And what's the worst case? Well, the best case scenario is that simply our bodies uh, uh, recognize Omicron. Uh, the, the vaccines work as well as they have on all the other variants. And that uh, we don't see a significant impact, especially on those who've been vaccinated, those who maybe have been infected in the past, that we don't see a level of sickness, a level of infection, and a level of transmission that we were worried about before we had vaccines or even with Delta. You know, the worst case scenario is certainly that Omicron does cause a level of sickness, even among the vaccinated, that uh, we, we really have avoided with other variants. But I think we are increasingly seeing that a number of the people who are infected with Omicron, especially those who've been vaccinated, are experiencing mild symptoms. And, and doing pretty well. This week, you were with Governor Newsom talking about that. You were in the Central Valley. He was asked, are we gonna have more lockdowns? And his big answer, if everybody does our part, there won't be more lockdowns, but there is a little bit of an opening there. Uh, what is the potential metric that you would be using for more restrictions? You, you know, what we are focused on is having Californians do those things that we know work. That is get your shot get vaccinated, get boosted as soon as you can, because we know that wraps a strong blanket of protection around Californians, not just around Omicron, but frankly, around the Delta variant that we're still contending with. Get tested if you have any exposures or symptoms. Wear your mask in indoor public settings and stay home when you're sick. If we do those four things, we really believe California is well poised to weather whatever COVID throws at us. So we aren't even talking about what the triggers are around those sorts of restrictions that people were uh, accustomed to early on and frankly have grown tired of. Uh, so we're watching the scenarios closely and the situation closely. But right now, 
laser focused on Californians doing the things we have control over right now. A, a concern that you talked about is that this variant may not work as well when it comes to vaccines. Um, so we hear that they're developing a potential Omicron vaccine that could come out in 100 days, which leaves some people to say, well, why do I need to get boosted now? Why shouldn't I just wait until that comes out? What do you say to those people? I think, um, thank God, we have uh, the capacity with our pharmaceutical partners to develop vaccines quickly in case that is what's needed. But what we suspect is the vaccines that we are using today that have protected us on prior variants are going to be effective on Omicron. It's still a, a little bit uh, to be seen how effective and what we need to be worried about. But uh, because of our confidence and what we've seen so far, making sure people get boosted and vaccinated with the vaccines we have today uh, is really the safest way for us to proceed over the next many weeks, especially with the holidays and gatherings, that this is the kind of protection California should get now. The last time we talked, I was pressing you on the date to potentially end mask mandates. D does this all with Omicron, does it change the equation any update on may, when we could potentially remove some of those mask mandates, especially outdoors? Well, uh, you, you know, in, in large, uh, large part, we have been laser focused on this part of the calendar. Last year, you know, we all remember how bad it was in California. This was the time we started to see radical increase in cases followed by hospitalizations and deaths. And that took us through largely the month of January. We are laser focused on making sure history doesn't repeat itself, that we keep these protective measures in place over the next many weeks. Omicron at, uh, raises some additional questions, requires us to keep looking at more and more information and data, waiting to understand what's happening in other parts of the world. So right now we are still sort of getting through the winter, reassessing once we get through these these holidays and where we need to go as a state. So what are we looking at then? February, March? When, when's a potential end date for some of this stuff? Yeah, we're certainly looking, uh, uh, hoping that we'll have the evidence, the data, the information to support making some changes uh, uh, early next year. Uh, you know, we always like to end with something fun here on The Issue Is. So we know you're a father of four. You got little kids at home. How was Thanksgiving and, and what are you most excited about for the holidays? Thanksgiving was tremendous. My youngest, uh, she turned six right around Thanksgiving. So we have a birthday and lots of food. And my mom came down and cooked up a storm and we had a terrific time. And uh, of course, getting the tree up, sharing time with those young kids and making sure that uh, both my their mom and me are, are there for them and, and uh, capturing those fun moments. Lots to look forward to. And, and uh, yeah, I'm super excited about it. And maybe in the new year, there'll be some new art from them up on the walls. Uh, one of the oh, best it, Zoom it, backgrounds. My, my six-year-old warned me today that at the end of today, she's going to come home with some new artwork. So the next time, Alex, these will be different. All right. Can't wait to see. Happy holidays to you and the entire family. And, and to you. Thanks for all you do. Up next, our political panel, Bob Shrum and Mike Murphy. But as we go to break, here is Pedrito Fragoso at the California Christmas tree lighting. My plan I'm announcing today pulls no punches in the fight against COVID-19. And it's a plan that I think should unite us. It doesn't include shutdowns or lockdowns, but widespread vaccinations and boosters and testing and a lot more. President Biden laying out his plan to defeat COVID, but could COVID defeat him politically? Let's talk about that and more with our R Star panel this week. For decades, Bob Schramm served as one of the top Democratic strategists in the country. He is now serving as the director of the USC Center for the Political Future with our next guest. For decades, Mike Murphy served as one of the top Republican strategists in the country. He's currently the co-host of one of my favorite podcasts. It is called Hacks on Tap. He co-hosts with David Axelrod and Robert Gibbs. Bob, Mike, welcome back. And as a USC alum, for your USC students watching, fight on. Fight on. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. 
Uh, Mike, let, let's start with you. Joe Biden's been in office for almost a year now. What words come to mind for you when assessing his performance? You know, I would say uneven. Um, some things I think he's been pretty good at. You know, I'm an ideological critic. I'm a conservative. I think he's done a good job of bringing some normalcy, sanity, and honesty back uh, to the White House. He's not, you know, declared war on our democratic norms, but he's stumbled. I think he's had stumbles in foreign policy. And, you know, COVID, I think by the metric of experts, he's done better. But we now know that there's no political winning with COVID. People are mad about it and they take it out on the incumbent. Um, he also has problems on the left wing of his party, which I think is starting to define him a bit more than I expected. He ran as a centrist, but his poll numbers have collapsed for a reason. And he's got some time to repair them. But with the midterms looming, uh, he's got to do an upshift and get back in gear here. He's struggling for sure. What do you think is the reason, Bob, that, that the president's poll numbers are, are collapsing? And if you were advising him, what would you tell him? Well, I think there are two reasons. Uh, first of all, the economy is doing very well, but people don't know it because of inflation. And secondly, the Delta variant came along, and now we have this other new variant. And although I, I think the president's done a terrific job in terms of getting the vaccines out there, in terms of the other steps he's taken, people are frustrated. Mike is absolutely right about that. So I think he, had, number one, uh, has to do everything he can to unwind these supply chain difficulties that are principally responsible for driving up prices. And number two, they've got to do everything they can to get not only everybody here vaccinated or as many people as possible, we have to vaccinate the rest of the world, uh, we and the other developed countries, because if we don't, we're gonna see more variants and one of those variants is gonna slip through the vaccines. And Bob, as bad as Joe Biden's poll numbers have been, Kamala Harris's poll numbers have been a lot worse. She is the least popular vice president in history, according to recent polls. Well, uh, there have been some not so subtle stories leaked about Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg potentially running against her for president. And then you look at this video from this week showing the two of them at an infrastructure event together, clearly trying to hammer home the point that they're on the same team, trying to tamp down some of those rumors. But what is going wrong in the VP's office right now? And if you were advising her, what would you suggest to do to fix it? Harris's problem is, first of all, she's caught up in the general disillusion right now that people have with the administration. She has been given very tough assignments. And the thing that I worry about most is the kind of staff turnover that you see in her office. Uh, Simone Sanders leaving yesterday, other people leaving. I think that what she has to do, and what, and what if I were her, I would ask to do, is she needs to start going, for example, on the Sunday shows, on the cable shows. She needs to become a very visible spokesperson for the administration. The first thing she's got to do, I agree with Bob, is fix the staff infighting problem. Because if your own players can't even get out on the field and play together, how are you ever going to compete in this high stakes world you find yourself in? And that has she's been got time, a, but she's got problems. But staff infighting has been a problem for her uh, way back in her time in, here in California. In every job yep. that she's been in, that's been a problem. And so maybe that yep. has something to do with her. I would bet that because that, you know, Bob and I have been politics a long time. And when it's a persistent problem, you start looking at the one thing that doesn't change. And that's who's in charge. But she, they, they need to step back and take stock because her situation is slipping. And uh, that's not a path forward in the tough business she's in. Up next, Bob and Mike on whether California's crime spree could be bad news for Democrats. But first, more music from the California Christmas tree lighting in Sacramento. Here's Glee star Amber Riley. That's what Christmas means to me, my love. Images like these are becoming far too common up and down the Golden State, but could they soon be politically problematic for Democrats? Back with our political panel, Democratic strategist Bob Schramm, Republican strategist Mike Murphy. Mike, we know the Democrats have dominated this state for years, except for when you helped to run the Schwarzenegger campaign. Do you think this crime issue could actually create an opening for the GOP? You know, it's a rising issue. Uh, people are becoming upset about it, and that is generically to the Republicans' advantage. 
The problem is, at least on a statewide basis and in most of the metroplexes, the Democrats have a triple strangler Lewis, you know, uh, chokehold on the state politically. Uh, there just aren't enough DTS and, and Republicans. Republicans have all this Trump baggage and all the uh, January 6th crazy. So I doubt it's enough. But in some local elections, it's definitely going to break through. It is rising. And it, these swarm crimes are happening in places where suburbanites, who are the key swing voters in, in, in this country, are, are feeling dangerous and scared. And uh, the Republicans are better on that issue because people presume that Democrats, fair or unfair, are are passive on, on, on crime issues. The Democrats are perceived as not being as tough on crime. Bob, do you think that this could be a, a real problem for Democrats? Sure. And I think Newsom uh, ought to be out there. And uh, Democratic officials, mayors, DAs ought to be out there and get, and they ought to say, we're going to get tough on this stuff. Look, I'm not for cash bail, but I'm against letting out dangerous detainees like the person who killed or apparently killed Jackie Avant the other night. I think it's absolutely idiotic to say that people can wander in or, or crash in to one of these stores, grab a whole lot of stuff, and then not get prosecuted because they're only caught with one $950 thing, and that's a misdemeanor and we're not going to prosecute it. And beyond Newsom, I think Joe Biden ought to think about next year making absolutely clear that he is decoupled from what I call the Hall of Fame of terrible slogans, exemplified by defund the police, by proposing a bill that pays for more police and better trained police. Mm. There's no conflict between police reform and law enforcement. We ought to have both. And Biden ought to make it clear that we ought to have both, and so should Newsom. And right now, if I were the DA in LA, for example, and there's a recall effort against him, I'd be worried about some of this. Yeah, and, and Mike, Bob brings this up. I mean, in some of California's top jobs right now are people that are not saying what Bob just said. You know, are these people in trouble? Well, I think they are if they get real opposition. What happened is the center of gravity in Democratic politics a year ago was pulling toward to fund the police. The cops are the problem. And, you know, there is a need for police reform. We've seen it in different places. But now, you know, the, when crime goes up, everybody's a liberal and worried about cops till they need one. Mm -hmm. And one thing that you hear, at least anecdotally, in police circles in California and everywhere else, is that the police are feeling very defensive and therefore they're working passively. So, you know, the police are toning back culturally because they, they're not getting that feeling of support from the electeds. And that sends a message and vacuums get filled. So it's a cultural problem, too. And when these, these office holders don't step up and explain that most cops are good and doing their job, um, you start to have this systemic failure and voters get really mad and stuff happens. Mm. Important discussion. Uh, you know, we always like to have a little bit of fun here on this show. So uh, we want to play a special holiday edition of our personal issues game. We're putting 30 seconds on the clock. We're going to go back and forth between you real rapid fire to learn your holiday favorites. All right, we ready to go? Uh, Bob, let's start with you. What is your favorite holiday food? Uh, Stuffing. Mike? Uh, turkey and gravy. Mike, what is your favorite holiday song? Uh, White Christmas. Bob? Uh, Jingle Bells. Bob, what's your favorite holiday movie? Uh, White Christmas. Mike? Bob was in White Christmas. I would say Scrooge. <laughs> <laughs> and Bob, real or fake tree? Uh, real trait. Mike? Absolutely real. All right. You guys are the real deal. Uh, happy holidays, my friends. Always enjoy talking with you. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, happy holidays to you, you and fight on. Fight on. Uh, happy more of the, holidays, everybody. More of the issue is after this, but first, more holiday music from the California Christmas tree lighting. Here's the Oakland Interfaith Gospel Choir. Now to our exclusive conversation this week with the current Secretary of Labor and a former one. Spectacular affordable units. And stuff. U.S. Labor Secretary Marty Walsh and L.A. County Supervisor Hilda Solis check out the construction underway at the Grand L.A. It's a 45-story building designed by Frank Gehry located just across the street from the Disney Concert Hall in downtown L.A. 
We speak in an exclusive interview. This certainly seems like, like an opportunity for everyone in every community and every city. We're in the hard hat because we're in the middle of a construction zone. The building being built behind us is allocating 20% of its units to affordable housing. This is what one of those units looks like. We have so many uh, union members that helped to build this, both men and women, and I'm very proud of that. So Lise served as President Obama's first labor secretary. You know a thing or two about his job as the former Secretary of it's Labor. <laughs> Would you give him any advice? What's, what's this? I think he's like? doing a great job already. We have to lean on uh, pre predecessors to understand the process. Another major challenge for the Biden administration, fixing our supply chain issues. This week, Secretary Walsh touring the ports of L.A. and Long Beach and looking at ways to increase the number of truck drivers there. The Department of Labor is working with the Teamsters and we're working to think about how do we create a better pathway into that, into those jobs, maybe using our veterans. On a lighter note, the former mayor of Boston says he is loving the California sunshine, but the diehard Red Sox fan says he is missing former Red Sox turned Dodger outfielder Mookie Betts. Mookie Betts, we lent them for you for a couple of years. We want them back. Right. Well, that's never going to happen. Right. Yeah. No way. Uh, next week on the issue is Governor Newsom gets personal. I have pretty severe dyslexia, and it really marked uh, a relationship with me with having to find ways to overcompensate and deal with the deep issues and stresses of self-esteem. Next week, a new interview with Governor Newsom about his struggle with dyslexia as his new book about it goes on sale. And in two weeks, we travel to Calusa County for a special half hour with former Governor Jerry Brown on his ranch way off the grid. We end this week with the current governor lighting this year's Capitol Christmas tree surrounded by beautiful music. We'll see you next week. Good, good, good.